Hello. So, welcome to this vlog slash review for, where is my book? Let me grab it. Midnight Tides by Steven Erickson. So I wanted to structure things a little bit different this time, give this a try, since it's really, really hard for me to take all of the notes. These books are so dense, so intricate, so complicated. I have a hard time going back and doing really detailed spoiler reviews afterwards. I'm not gonna lie, it's very stressful for me. So I thought I would at least give it a try to do a vlog style kind of gush about my thoughts as I'm reading it. Then just recap everything in my final thoughts in more of a review format at the end. Laundry is just being started. That's what the water sounds are. So we'll give that a try. Now I did start this book two mornings ago. It reads so slow for me. Anytime I am starting a new Malazan book and I have to reorient myself in the world and get used to new characters and just get a grasp for what's happening, I can read like 30 pages an hour, which for me is really slow. Like if that's fast for you, more power to you, no judgment whatsoever. But like young adult books, I'm not kidding you, I can read like almost 100 pages in an hour. Most adult books, I can read close to 60 pages in an hour. I would say 50 for like across the board. Malazan, I can read about 30 pages in an hour. And so I'm on page 66, so I have just begun. And I'm really, really already enjoying the characters we're being introduced to, this setting and this time period. So I like all of the sibling dynamics and I have just met Bug and, how do you say his name? T hole maybe? Teal, tail, I don't know, whatever his name is. So I will, I'm gonna finish chapter two. I'm halfway through chapter two. And once I finish chapter two, I will give you guys some updates on like spoiler thoughts of what's going on so far. But I just wanted to get this vlog started and feel free to give me feedback at the end of it. But I just wanted to try it out for this time and see how it goes. So morning two of reading, Midnight Tides. Got one cat chilling here. One cat chilling there. And geez, I'm only three quarters of the way through chapter two. Yesterday I started the book, so I only read the prologue and half of chapter one yesterday. It takes me forever to read these books. So um, yeah, as you will have seen, I'm doing a little different format this time, but I've been introduced to a ton of characters so far. A ton of new characters or characters barely mentioned in the past. So I need to orient myself in this world again. <laughs> figure out what's going on. Immediate thoughts are that it's very interesting and I'm very excited to see where the book goes. But once I'm done working out, I will give you guys more of my thoughts on the first two chapters. Maybe I'll finish, finish chapter two before I give you my thoughts and then update. Okay, so I wanted to update a bit because I just finished chapter two of Midnight Tides. So let's start out with the prologue, which was pretty freaking epic and cool, in my opinion, with this battle between the Kachain Chamale and the Tisti Eater and Tisti Andy. I don't know how you say any of these things. It's so bad. It's so problematic. So I'm trying to keep track of everybody. Scabandari is Tisti Eater and Silchis Ruin is Tisti Andy. So Scabandari like basically tricks Silchis and takes him off and chains him up in for imprisonment after he sees the Jag Hut performing the ritual or whatever. So basically the Tisti Eater won and they want to get rid of the remaining Tisti Andy is what I think. I'm gonna be so upset if I'm saying all these names wrong. So basically Scabandari wants to conquer everything and now he can. And then we have this really cool scene with Mael asking Gothos, once again, names, you know, whatever, to preserve this battlefield in ice. And I love that. But I also thought it was really cool the information we got, which we probably got it in the past and that I forgot, about the three sons of Mother Dark being Anomander Rake, Andarist, and Silchus Ruin. And Scabandari thinks the other two are like no more and now he's imprisoning Silchus. That's what makes him think, he, think he's good to go. So I, th I thought that that was really interesting. Um, and I am like super, I'm wanting to know more about the three because like I didn't understand they were siblings. I don't know. And I don't know what's up with the next scene in the prologue with Withal having to make this sword for the gods. So I don't know what's up with there, but I was very interested immediately. So in chapter one, I'm like, what's going on with these seals and the Letheri? however you say it? We're introduced to Troll, Sengar, and his brother Fear, and his other brother Rulad, I think. I'm keeping these straight. I'm not so sure. It's so hard. 
so many people introduced in the beginning and the warlock king were introduced too and i'm pretty sure he wants like vengeance against the lathari i liked the introduction to the feather witch i thought that she was pretty cool and udinas that's in love with her i am intrigued as to where they're going to come up more so troll and his brothers and the king are meeting with the eater tribes and the warlock king asks them to travel beyond the eater lands into the snow and the ice to complete this task and retrieve a gift that he saw in his vision but they can't touch it so i'm assuming that's going to be like the main chunk of the story which i'm here for i love a traveling story and i'm interested in like the healing magical powers of troll's mother and so far i like troll's character i liked him from house of chains so i like him in this book i think that it is very confusing so far to keep track of everybody new it's probably the most thrown off i've been starting any new Malazan book so I'm really having a rough time you guys. Then we meet Saren Padek and Baruch the Pale and Hall Bedict. So Hall is worshipped by the Narek people whatever. I'm trying so hard to keep this straight and I feel like the first couple chapters are always a lot of setup but it's rough this time. It's interesting, it's good, but I am confused and I really wanna know if you guys were confused when you started this as well. I think so far, my favorite is the introduction to Tihal and his servant, Bug. I have heard so many good things about the two of them and their interactions and their relationship. And obviously, Steven Erickson is great at writing his dynamic duos, so I'm excited for where their characters are going. Just all the character interactions between the two of them. So he follows these three women that are looking for him. And it sounds like they're wanting to have Tiho help them to basically grow their investment so they can purchase more islands for their people and cause the Lethary economy to collapse, something like that. The last part of chapter two, the last update I have is pretty confusing in Lethiras with Bryce and the brothers and Prince Kias. What I got out of that section was basically that Bryce fears that Hall will kill Prince Kia at the meeting and I need to keep going. I need to keep going. And I'm very curious to know who else out here felt this lost at 12% of the way through Midnight Tides. Because, but what's cool is I've already seen mentioned this scene that's going on, at least the, the skeleton there. So yeah, I just, uh, I'm lost. I'm lost guys. I'm usually not this lost, but we shall press onward. I'm just reading late at night. This is just a random paragraph in the middle of chapter three that I loved. It says, perhaps that is the truth of madness. When a mind can do nothing but make endless lists of the mundane tasks awaiting it as proof of its sanity. I just love that. I've reread it like four times now. Back biking reading. I'm just going to keep it totally real with you guys. I'm struggling through this book, but I just met a character that I finally really like. Shirk, the uh, not living lady. I like her a lot. So I'm almost done with chapter four. I'll try to get through chapter five and then update you guys. So I've just finished chapter four. I still have a whole lot of no idea of what's going on. I think <laughs> the only thing keeping me sane while reading this right now is Shirk, if that's even how you say her name, and Kettle. I love the two of them together, these undead. I cannot wait to find a picture. I'm gonna put it in here if I can find some fan art for it. But feeding the Azath tower dead bodies because it needs it to stay alive. And then Kettle says, if it dies, everything will get out. And so I'm like, okay, what, what is going on with that here? And then the end of this chapter, the five kin creatures taken and held since the time of the Kachain Chamale were almost within reach of the surface and they were Toblakai. Um, so that's exciting. That makes me very interested to see what's going on here. So thank goodness for Shirk and Kettle and the Azoth Tower. <laughs> Cause let me tell you, I, I like, I'm gonna look up how to say his name actually for once. I'm actually gonna do it. T-Hall and the siblings, but I just feel so lost. You know what I should do is re-reference um, Dramatis Personae, however you say that, because I think that would be really helpful to see who belongs where. Because sometimes I forget that you can do that. Oh, wait. Who is Bryce? Sometimes I get so confused. 
He's Lethiri, Lethiri, however you say it. Oh man, all I know is I don't, I don't really have too much else to say about the first four chapters other than the ending of chapter four saved it for me and I'm gonna keep plugging away. So as I'm reading Steven Erickson's books, so much what I love about his books is not even necessarily from the story itself. It's kind of like the quotes that I read before and that I'm gonna probably continue to keep reading throughout this book because it's his um analysis of the world nowadays throughout his fictional world for example Udinas I don't know if that's how you say his name but when he said he'd known many for whom certainty was a god the only god no matter the cast of its features and he had seen the manner in which such belief made the world simple where all was divisible by the sharp cleaving of cold judgment after which no mending was possible he had seen such certainty yet had never shared it but he had always believed the world itself was unquestionable not static never static but capable of being understood it was undoubtedly cruel at times and deadly but you could almost always see it coming so he's there's been so much talk about the belief in certainty and like religion and gods and i just really enjoy the discussion in about that so far in this book and it's it's those things throughout his books that really make me appreciate his writing so much but what is his name Udinas? his dreams man and what's going on right now first of all the one with the rape um that was something i do appreciate though that steven erickson i mean I don't know how you can say that you appreciate rape being in a book, but I can appreciate that it's not just rape of women. It's very much rape of men, um, very frequently that is discussed in these books as well. And just as a female reader, I can really appreciate that it's not so one-sided because I feel like most of the time reading, it is rape of a female in fantasy books. So I'm gonna finish book one. I have 12 pages left. And then we'll see. And just speaking of chapter, the end of chapter four, wait, the end of chapter five, Wither is showing Udinas his death. And is that referencing the prologue, I'm assuming, because we're talking about Silchus Ruin and kind of seeing the battle with the Kachin Shamale. So I'm assuming we've gone back to the prologue. So I spent way too long reading last night. I went to, well, I read until I went to bed. I went to bed really early and then I was up at 4.30 reading again. So I've made quite a bit of progress. In Midnight Tides. I just read chapter seven, which is what I finished up on. And I think that that's been maybe my favorite so far because I really enjoy the story with a quitter, Saren Pedak and Hall Bedick arriving at the Eater Village. I like their whole storyline and what's going on with them and needing to speak to the Warlock King because I think I'm finally like understanding where things are going with them and that they are trying to protect the Neric. I think Udinas and then the Feather Witch are probably the most interesting at this point once again with his visions and then I'm always intrigued when with anything with like the sisters so we see Menendor again and Sukul however you say her name and Sheltatha daughter dusk protector of the eater and I don't know why I'm just so intrigued by them and with the prologue and the brothers and I don't know I just I want to know more about them because we meet their father Asirk who's the son of dark and light it's just there's so much there's so much and we find out that he's been fighting with Anomanda Rake and we see him take his soul taken form but discussing Sheltatha and when they talk about envy and spite is it Lady Envy am I, or am I crazy? I don't know. I just love anything with the dragon forms. I love the imagery and I just think it's really unique and inter interesting. And that's why I'm most interested in that portion of the story, I think. And with the Feather Witch, with her reading, I was like, she's telling everyone they're doomed. I don't really know what's going on. Something with the Azath hold and house and the Elaint. I don't really understand much about them and the ice and the Jagha. And I just really, it's a whole lot of what's happening right now. Um, but it does feel like it's getting a bit easier to follow along with. And I think that things are going to start connecting a bit as we keep going. Cause I would imagine I'm close to 30% of the way through right now, but I just want to update you guys before I get on the treadmill and read a bit more. So I don't get too far ahead of myself real quick. Me again in chapter six, I forgot to mention when Bryce is below the sea and he encounters this whole like sanctuary type thing with all the glyphs. And I love, I don't know, like the, 
car tower type things is what I'm picturing. And he figures out that these are not demons, but they are the forgotten gods. And I was like, I think you're getting mixed up in some stuff that you don't really want to be mixed up in right now. So Mael created this sanctuary so that these gods wouldn't be forgotten because they've, lo they've lost their names. So the missing one lost its name and was obliterated and then bound to becoming a slave with a new name. And then Bryce says that he will take all the names of the forgotten gods so that no one can enslave them. And then he wakes up with Kuru Khan or however you say it, um, that whole part. See, scenes like this are why I love the book series so much in the midst of when I have no idea what's going on. Like some things like this are so cool that I just enjoy reading it so much. So I didn't want to forget to mention that scene that I really enjoyed, but that's about, that's about it. I think I already talked about Shirk and Kettle and how I love them and they were like keeping me going. So, so far, seven chapters in, there's just like a little things here and there keeping the story going for me when it's really tough to totally wrap my mind around everything that's happening. I don't know why. I don't know if it's because I have anxiety about so many other things in life right now, but I have not struggled through a Malazan book this much. And that's not to say I'm not enjoying it, or I'm not glad that I'm reading it because I am. I am enjoying it and I am happy to be reading it. I just have a harder time comprehending things right now. And like that's life sometimes. So we'll keep going. Okay, so chapter eight was one of my favorites definitely so far. We're following the Sengar brothers as they're north to grab this gift for the Warlock King. And that was very, very epic scenes. I think some of my favorite things about this chapter were just the ability that Steven Erickson has to make us care so much for these characters when you didn't even know that you were caring for them yet. Um, that is something I feel like I didn't think I was attached to any of them yet, and I definitely was, but also just the imagery, the feeling of Troll being freezing, feeling like he's losing his mind, running away, fighting for his life. Um, I could feel the chill in my bones and I think I just appreciate that so much because I'm always a very cold person. <laughs> so I think that he did a phenomenal job like just picturing the ice on the eyelashes like I'm a runner. I've been there and um, you could just feel the pain of the cold in his hands being numb and you could feel him not sure if he's alive or dreaming or who else is alive, but most importantly, we see how upset he is at Rulad, his brother, for falling asleep on the watch. And I'm like, wow, you really let them down. I'd be pissed too. But then when he dies and he goes through these emotions that he's not sure what he's supposed to be feeling, and he realizes like, I'll never see him smile again or all the experiences he'll never have with him again. It's just like, breaks your heart for Troll, even though you didn't care about Rulad, or at least I didn't, I don't know if you did. I just think his ability to evoke certain emotions out of me is what I love so much about the books. And yeah, I just loved that whole scene. I loved him being a badass warrior, fighting all the wolves and all of the, shoot, what were the people called? Jack? I forget the names of them, but that was probably my favorite chapter so far. I loved that one. And uh, sounds like they better keep going. Troll had it rough, man. He needs to get out of there. Okay, I have to hurry because my sister and brother-in-law and nephew just got here. So much happened in chapter nine. And when we start out with the scene with the crippled god, talking to Rulad, I was like, okay, what are you doing with him? What is his mission going to be? What are you using him for? And then as Uranas is preparing his body and he wakes back up and he's just been prepared with the wax and the coins and Uranas is like, tired to the point past exhaustion at this point I am dying to see what happens next and is he really like living now um what happened with the gift that was the sword that was supposed to be for the warlock king that like took him to the crippled god what was the warlock king trying to do with that situation that Rulad ended up being there and what's going to end up happening with the warlock king now that he's mad and says that the brothers failed him what was his what was his goal here and now what is the crippled god going to use him for and i just really like Udinas, and i'm just really curious about his part in this whole story that was a good chapter man that was a good chapter okay i've just started chapter 11 at this point and i think one thing that i'm finding pretty what's the word i'm looking for 
there's such a contrast between the parts with Bug and T Hall and Bryce and whatever's going on there, and then the parts going on with Udinas and Rulad and Fear and Troll. And the tone is so different that it's almost it's it's strikingly different between the two. And it sort of pulls you back for a moment, like, okay, wait, we're getting back to this like serious story. And obviously I think that between he always uses these like dynamic duos for a bit of comic relief maybe even or to lighten the tone in some areas which is good and I really appreciate their part of the story and the lightheartedness and humor that they add to it but it's jarring a bit for me when we switch back and forth and I feel way more invested in the story with the Sengar family and Udinas and the Feather Witch than I do with Bryce and T-Hole and Bug and their whole situation. Um, I'm definitely way less interested in that. But finally in chapter 10, I was starting to see some of the humor that everybody talks about loving their relationship so much. So that was worth noting, I suppose. Okay, so I just finished book two, whatever chapter that was. Um, 11. Man, some wild stuff just happened, okay? So I was in the beginning kind of intrigued by roulade i was like okay you go you tell them what's up because i don't really love the warlock king and i don't know what he was going to do to them for failing to complete this task that he needed them to do meaning the brothers so i was like okay let's put him in his place so when he bowed down to him i was pretty shocked i didn't see that happening quite as easily as it did and then we just see this massive turn in him where he takes his takes his brother's betrothed and just like does not give a flying you know what and he just is, seems very heartless very cold and i'm sure it's that way for a purpose she's like curling up behind me and i'm very excited to see where it goes and udinas is freaking out and saying the eater have been usurped and there's a traitor on the throne now and Things are getting crazy, so I guess we'll see where it goes in book three. Curly Biking, reading chapter 13 and 14. And I love Bug and Kettle together so much, but I'm a little confused because I know she was talking about the five Toblakai that are about to rise from the ground and they're getting the swords. But who is the one that is buried that is trying to rise from the ground from my understanding? And is this at the, the Azoth, Azath house, tower, whatever, that is dead? Is that where this is occurring? I feel a little bit confused. But anyways, the relationship is precious and I'll update more once it's done working out. So this is a little bit out of order, but I had found these screenshots on my phone from when I was reading on my phone at night and could not update because it was dark in the room. So one of the quotes that I think because like humanity and compassion and hope is like talked about so much as themes in Mel's on Book of the Fallen. So this conversation that Bryce is having and he's saying, why have you shown me this? I make you witness, Bryce Bedict, to the symbol of your demise. Why? The figure was silent for a moment then said, I advise you to not look for hope from your leaders for they shall feed you not but lies. Yet hope exists. Seek for it, Bryce Bedict. In the one who stands at your side, from the stranger upon the other side of the street, be brave enough to endeavor to cross the street. Look neither skyward nor upon the ground. Hope persists, and its voice is compassion and honest doubt. That is all I would tell you, all I can tell you. And I just think that that like drives home the theme so much. It's all of the subtle like conversations with people and things like this that are some of the biggest points or takeaways for me, I suppose, from my reading experience. Another thing that I had screenshot was just when, shoot, I can't remember which chapter this was, but just basically we had confirmation that Rulad has the sword that Wither made from the beginning. Is that correct? Am I crazy? That commands the wraiths, which are the Tisty Andy spirits. Am I crazy? Am I right? I'm not sure, but those are the things that I had screenshots of in my phone that I thought I would go over real quick. So we just had the conversation with Kettle where she was told that she's the nameless one and that that means something important. She's actually two, two souls and he wants to get her out of the body. And I think that I'm most intrigued by her storyline right now with the Azath Tower and what's going on with them. I feel like that is the most intriguing. I also think with 
with Rulad and the overthrowing of the Warlock King, that storyline, but I just like Kettle. I just like Kettle so much and I need to know what's gonna happen to her. I'm scared for her, kind of. So I want you guys to know that I'm like really restricting myself in how many quotes that I'm reading and stuff because I really want to read more um, just because I love Steven Erickson's writing so much, but it just stands out to me so much. And I believe the uh, Feather Witch and Udinas are still talking about the Talana mask when they say he met her eyes then simply shook his head, a casual turning away, gaze once more upon the ruins, this destruction, this slaughter, a terrible thing to do. Maybe they deserved it. Maybe they did something. Featherwitch, the question of what is deserved should rarely, if ever, be asked. Asking it leads to deadly judgment and acts of unmitigated evil. Atrocity revisited in the name of justice breeds its own atrocity. We, Lethuri, are cursed enough with righteousness without inviting yet more. You live soft, Udinas, in a very hard world. I told you I was not without anger, which you bleed away somehow before it can hurt anyone else. So just that first part of that, I just love it. I love every single thing it says. And I just love that he puts these things that just make you think so much and relate so much to our world in his fantasy worlds. That's what I love. That's what makes me so passionate about these books. So I have got to go to work, but just finished chapter 15. I want to reread it again, actually, because I loved it so much. And I feel like so many important things happened with the Feather Witch and Udinas finding the, I don't know, it was like they said they were in a hold, like another world as ghosts with the Talana mass and seeing everything frozen. And the statement again, which we already know about the Talana mass just being like memories. I just need to like reread it again. I feel like to fully comprehend that whole scene. If any of you want to be so kind as to recap slightly, I'm getting worried because this footage is almost already an hour and I'm only like halfway through the book, which is not good because then I want to do like a slight recap at the end of this. I don't know what I'm going to do, but I am enjoying this format much more. It's much less stressful for me to just say my thoughts as I go rather than trying to recap them. I would love to know your guys' thoughts. Do you hate the as I go thoughts? and prefer the way I used to do it because I feel like that way it was just choppy and really didn't make a lot of sense and it was so much more stressful to me. So let me know your thoughts. I need to hurry and go to work. It's so early, I couldn't sleep. <laughs> so um, I'm halfway through chapter 16 and I had a friend start mails on recently and he said to me, it's weird because you never know who to root for. And I'm like, mm-hmm, that is the thing with mails on is you never know who the good guys are or the bad guys. It's You never know who you want to win. And between the Tissy Eater and the Lathiri or however you say their names, it's like I don't know who I'm rooting for I never know who I'm rooting for I know which characters I like and then everything I didn't think I liked Seren and then everything that happened to her with being drugged and whatever and then that child and then iron bars trying to help her I'm just like I hate the Tissy Eater but then the other times I'm like I hate the Lethere or the Letherai and uh I just wanted to know that because you never know who to root for. I just finished 16. So I think one thing that's really interesting to me, like watching from Udinas perspective and having him see everything kind of from the outside and watching Rulad come back from the dead again, and then Rulad talking to the crippled God and how history can be so skewed and um, a different version is told depending on who won or which culture you're from because like, him calling Rulad basically a traitor when from, you know, a neutral perspective, clearly the Tissy Eater betrayed the Tissy Andy and that is how they conquered everyone, but he doesn't see it that way and he gets mad and defensive and it's just, just interesting watching Erickson tackle these themes and discussions about how history is portrayed and I really enjoy it. I'm in bed reading probably can't see all over there. Almost 80% of the way through book five of Malazan, and y'all, we're getting an explanation of how warrens work. Kind of. <laughs> Finally. Love it. I'm here for it. Okay, sorry about this garbage footage, but I am in bed, and it's been a very stressful day, so I'm not turning the lights on. Um, I am so shocked by how much Saren has become a favorite. I love her. And this whole passage about taking away her memories and Corlo saying, it's not the memories that are hurting a quitter, it's how you feel about them. It's the you now warring with the you then. 
and then uh, she goes on to say she has she had been repeating scenes a grim realization repeating scenes for most of her life she had imposed her own pattern bereft of nuance and had viewed her despair as a legitimate response perhaps the only legitimate response a conceit of being intelligent almost preternaturally aware of the multitude of perspectives that was possible in all things and that had been the trap all along the sorceress incantation called grief her invitation to demons of self-recrimination reappearing again and again on that tapestry different scenes the same leering faces oh my god I haven't updated in a few days because it's been a stressful few days, or at least updated much. So I've been mostly reading in bed in the dark. And, oops, reading in bed in the dark, and it's hard to update then. But I made it to chapter 24. I have two chapters in the epilogue left. Um, this bruise on my lip is from running into the wall and giving myself a bloody face and tooth. <laughs> if uh, you missed that update. But, um, so just ignore that. But anyways, so I feel like the last several, several chapters, maybe even 20 or so percent of the book has really just been battles and warring, which generally is something I really dislike um, because it's just kind of boring to me usually. But Steven Erickson does some phenomenal battles in my opinion. And the battle between the Lethari and Tisti Eater, where we see, is it Hanan Mosag, the Warlock King, with his sorcery just like took the f you know what over everything it destroyed everything um that was a cool battle to read i really appreciated that i thought it was really interesting to see and um i think that i would like more battles if they were all that well done so just interesting dynamics to see between the power there and then rulad being upset about the number of tisty eater and demons and wraiths that have died and now they're gonna go conquer lethra or whatever the place is called and what else? Udinas is the star of the show. Let's be honest, Saren has completely taken over their whole aspect. I fell in love with her. I think those are most of my overall thoughts for now. I know this vlog is already super long, so I'm trying to keep updates short so that I can do a little wrap up at the end as well. I was waiting for this to happen because I really want to finish this book today before I leave for Richmond tomorrow. And I get to chapter 25, the last chapter. And I was like waiting for this to be in true Steven Erickson fashion. And of course I am correct. The last chapter is 75 pages long when the rest have been like 30, 30 to 50, usually 35 ish. Yeah, he always does this. I feel like at this point, I'm definitely supposed to know who the five Toblaki are. The Saragal? But I don't. Should I? Are we ready for another quote? Troll Sengar could only wonder what bred such certainties, what made a people so filled with rectitude and intransigence. Perhaps all that is needed is power, a shroud of poison filling the air, seeping into every pore of every man, woman, and child, a poison that twisted the past to suit the mores of the present, illuminating in turn an inevitable and righteous future, a poison that made intelligent people blithely disregard the ugly truths of past errors and judgment, of horrendous, brutal debacles that had stained red the hands of their forefathers, a poison that entrenched the stupidity of dubious traditions and brought misery and suffering upon countless victims. Power then, the very same power we are about to embrace. Sisters, have mercy upon our people. I just had to read that like three times. I just love Steven Erickson's writing so much. Probably another dumb question, which is why I frequently feel not smart enough to read these books. But so the god or being the powerful one that Kettle kept referring to that was coming up from the Azap Tower and then we see Silchus Ruin is back now. So was that him all along that she was referencing? Because he was never giving a given a name that she was speaking to him. And I was kind of guessing it was one of the two from the prologue. You guys. Finding out that Bug is male. I'm sure that most of you probably put that together before this point in the story because um, I'm usually behind on these types of things, but what? And the exchange between him and t -Hole, where he's like, what does he say? Well, you're supposed to be my manservant. How can I continue the conceit of being in charge? <laughs> and he says, your real name, Mael. And he says, it doesn't fit. Bug is better. I agree. I love it. I love it. I love it. Okay, I don't have much time to update. It's Thanksgiving. I really should be doing things other than finishing this book, but I just finished. And I've been reading for so long. Oh my God.
that blog, I don't really get what, what the purpose was, what we were doing there. The last chapter. <sighs> we'll have to just sit with this for a bit, maybe reread a little bit again. I'm mad at fear for being a coward and leaving his brother, Troll, to do all the dirty work and try to save Rulad, who was killed by the demon thing, and now he's back again. And then we see Udanas. Oh my god, I love it so much. I don't understand why Fear is using Saren to help escape the city. Maybe because she's, like, knowledgeable. Um, but they're just eater and leather eye, so I would assume they're, like, enemies. And then we see Kettle with Udanas and the Wraith or somebody else. So they're all escaping on the run together, and I love that. Okay, gotta go. Quick initial thoughts, that's all. So as of right now, I already have 50 minutes of vlog clip reaction thought footage. So I want to just quickly wrap up some final thoughts as I finish the book. Just this morning, I read for probably two and a half hours today. It is Thanksgiving and I need to catch a flight to Richmond in the morning and I have so much to do. So I just want to quickly wrap up some thoughts for you guys so this video is not too long. I guess I, I don't even know where to begin to quickly wrap up thoughts. I think at this point I would have to give it a 4.75 out of 5 stars just because I had such a rough time getting into it and I can't tell if it was just me and life events, life, life circumstances that I was going through that maybe decreased my enjoyment or ability to really involve myself fully and understand everything that was going on or if it was the book, I'll know more upon reread, I suppose, because I definitely, I can't wait to reread this book already, but I had such a great time reading this book. So I will go with a 4.75 out of five stars right now. I think House of Chains, I did enjoy slightly more. I'm really shocked at a couple characters that really surprised me along the way that really stood out to me. And I thought that, I wish I knew if it was Lethari or Lethiri. I'm gonna say Lethari because that's what makes sense to me. No, I think it's Lethiri. Whatever. So Hull and Bryce, their whole family, I don't know, I guess just the, the La Theory in general weren't as interesting to me. And even though I was so back and forth about who I was rooting for the whole time, I felt like I kind of always was on the side for the Tissy Eater and I wanted them to win. I don't know if that's correct. I know there's no like wrong or right. I don't know what most people felt like, but I was always kind of rooting for the Tissy Eater. And I guess some things that I've sort of like gathered from trying to read a bit more and think things through. So the Warlock King was trying to get the sword from the crippled, crippled God to draw on his power to use it because he knew that Scavendari Blood Eye was dead. Is that correct? So that's why he sent him on the mission. I think that I really enjoyed that whole first like third of the book. That took a lot of time to make it to the point where Rulad gets the sword and dies and comes back. And I feel like I almost sympathized with the crippled god in this book. And I don't quite know why, but I just feel bad for him at this point. You're probably not supposed to. I don't know, but I'm just really curious because he's like the overall antagonist in this story from my understanding. And I just can't wait to find out what happens. <laughs> I think there were more distinct, separate storylines of different characters in this book that really like followed through separately with like Bryce and Tahal and Saren and Udanas. I think that I did enjoy the separate storylines for the most part in this book. And there were some parts that I definitely enjoyed less than others. I think that really, to me, the stars of this book were Udanas. I was fascinated from the beginning between him and the Feather Witch and watching his perspective as this Lathiri slave to the Tisti Eater people, um, just kind of like seeing everything happen from the outside and watch it unfold. And then after he gets raped and poisoned or whatever and has the demon in him. I think I'm a little foggy on how that all happened still. And he has these dreams. I was just fascinated by it. I could never tell even by the end how I felt about Rulad because sometimes I felt so bad for the kid and just wanted somebody to help him. And other times I was like, you suck, man. You really suck as a person. <laughs> And so it was just so hard for me to decide whether I was rooting for him or not. Um, same thing with the Warlock King. I was like, are you going to do anything good? Because at times I really hate you and at times I don't so much. And I guess that's just what I love about Steven Erickson's character so much is he has that ability to really make you question whether you like somebody or not because they are so morally gray and they're not black and white characters. So I love that. 
And once again, meeting this whole new cast of characters and having all of them feel so distinct from one another and feel so original is just mind blowing to me. Another couple favorites, of course, everyone's favorite, Tahal and Bug. Oh my God. I love them. I adore them. And at the beginning, it was kind of hard for me having such a contrast between the seriousness of Rulad's storyline and then just their witty, like humorous banter back and forth. And by the end, I loved it so much. And Bug, my favorite thing, my favorite thing, finding out that he's male, that God, did you guys see that coming? Because I did not see that coming. I was like mind blown when I was reading about it. And then, and then it just made everything else so much better. And the way that they're, they just continue to go on about their friendship. I am dying to continue following them because I've heard that we do. So fingers crossed that they, we get another book with them. Oh, I just love their storyline so much. Once again, Shirk and Kettle, I flipping love them. I love the entire portion with the Azoth house and kettle calling like whether it was mother or father or uncle or grandfather whoever was helping them i am dying to find out why where they're going where is kettle and udonas and the wraith demon whatever and who else was there with Saren and fear where are we going next i don't think it picks up in bone hunters i think it hurt i heard it picks up in shoot what is it book after that i'm not sure but either way that is like a very important storyline for me to follow. I feel very invested in all of those characters. Kind of said most of my thoughts already about Saren. I adore her by the end. I'm pretty mad at fear. I think uh, he's living up to his name and leaving everything to Troll. And it's a bit unfair. And I love Troll for having so much faith and hope in his brother that he could possibly convince him to not be influenced the way that he is anymore and to help save him from himself and the crippled god so i admire him for that what else happened here in the end it's pretty crazy to see what's happening to anybody that the crippled god has influence over and how he pretty much is just like destroying them so that's a bit curious to me in what his main objective is i suppose i guess i was a bit shocked because i thought this was going to be more of troll's story which obviously he has a pretty significant part in it but i would absolutely say it's not his over any of the other characters in the book but yeah i really liked the way that things wrapped up if they did there was obviously a lot of cliffhangers in this and then what was it it was still just ruin coming back right so what are we doing there? The Tissy Andy. I think one of my favorite parts that I really want to emphasize about reading this book is I was just always dying while reading the first four books for more of the history and world building things that happened in the past, especially revolving around the Tissy Andy and Tissy Eater. I'm always dying for more information and more about the Jag Hut. Three sons of like Mother Dark or whoever it is. Did I really just read this book? Yes, I did. And we got so much more information about all of those things. It just feels like a little, feels like things are becoming just a bit more clear. And I'm so thankful for that. I also feel like by the fifth book, I'm really learning how these books are meant to be read. And I'm really accepting that I'm not going to be able to catch every single thing on my first read through. And I'm okay with that. But I'm learning to follow the storylines a lot better. And I feel like there was just a lot in this book that related to other books in small ways in at least referencing the history of some things. So I really appreciate that because it just answers some questions of things that you've always wanted to know more information about while reading the other book. So I am dying to continue on. I, I always, as soon as I finish one of these books or while I'm in the process of reading it, because this time I didn't use any other sources to read at the same time I just read the book on its own and I forget how like life consuming it is for me. I read it every second I had a chance to read and I devoured it and it makes me so excited excited about reading. It reignites my passion for reading and my love for fantasy worlds. You'll know my love of Steven Erickson's writing and thoughts about relating his fantasy stories to real life history of historical events or present day things we're still dealing with. I just love this world so much and I'm probably forgetting to mention a bunch of things but this video is so long already at this point so that's why I said these Books really need to be broken down by book per book, if you know what I'm saying. And I think on reread, I'm sure I will do that. 
or maybe I'll just have more succinct thoughts because it's the second time I've read it. But those are most of my thoughts today. Like I said, I just finished it this morning, but I knew if I waited to film this when I got back from Richmond next week that they wouldn't be fresh in my mind anymore. So I at least wanted to get this out today. Let me know what your guys' favorite character was in this book. Who was your favorite? Which storyline was your favorite to follow? Did your opinions on anyone change from like beginning to end? Were you rooting for the Lethiri or the Tisty Eater? And what was your favorite, like, did I miss any major storylines or plot points? I'm sure I missed a million. You guys love to fill me in and I am so thankful for that. So let me know. I would love to chat with you guys more about it in the comments. And thank you guys for watching. I will see you next time.